You're diagnosing a problem in an electronic system, say anti-lock brakes or the airbag or the instrument panel cluster. If the problem's somewhere in the system itself, the service manual schematic and diagnostics for the system will help you find it. But that electronic module may be connected to several other modules via a serial data line or bus, and it might use input from one of those other modules, such as a sensor reading, in its operation. What if it's not getting that information? How do you diagnose that? If the fault is within that second system, you should have symptoms and probably a trouble code to tell you to do your diagnosis there. But what if the problem's somewhere in the bus itself? With some systems, it may set a code for loss of communications. But what if it doesn't? From now on, we'll all be doing more and more serial data line diagnosis because these communication lines are coming on strong in today's vehicles. Hi, I'm Jim Scopolitis. To start our look at data lines, let's do a quick review from the beginning. In 1985, we began to use the Tech one to read serial data from the ECM or PCM through Terminal M of the data link connector, which used to be called the ALDL, and through Terminal B to shift the PCM into various modes for diagnostic testing. Serial data moves through this line as a series of square waves. In the systems we've used so far, all signals last for the same specific length of time. The low signal is ground, and for the PCM's diagnostic line, high has been 5 volts. But that will be changing. Each of these signals is a bit, and eight of them form a byte. In a PCM system byte like this one, Bit zero might be programmed to be read as information about the canister purge solenoid. Bit one could concern the engine hot light, and so on. For both of these bits, high voltage could be programmed to mean the device is on, and low could mean it's off. For bits two and three, high could mean enabled, and low could mean not enabled, and so on. So, as square waves, the PCM sends to the DLC information about its system. And when the line is extended to include other modules, they may communicate with the DLC too. In early years, this circuit was used almost exclusively for diagnosis. But more recently, as vehicles began to incorporate additional modules that could benefit from talking to each other, it's been used increasingly for system operation. That's been especially true for the Toronado, and now for the 88, the 98, and the Aurora. Using the bus for system operation is very efficient and eliminates the need for many additional wires, but it can make diagnosis trickier. For instance, in older 88s and 98s, the PCM uses one engine coolant temperature sensor for engine operation, and the instrument panel cluster uses another one to operate the temperature gauge. But in 1994 models, the second sensor was eliminated, and the IPC began receiving coolant temperature from the PCM over the bus. A technician who doesn't know this might assume a non-registering gauge meant a cluster problem, when in fact it might mean a problem in the PCM system, or a problem with the bus. Here's another example. In the Toronado, the ECM and the body control module, or BCM, send a lot of sensor information by bus to the IPC for the indicator lights. If the bus is grounded, the cluster can go nearly blank. If you don't understand how the bus is involved, that's a problem to diagnose. With multiple cluster symptoms on a Toro, don't rush to replace the cluster. Instead, look for diagnostic trouble codes and get your multimeter ready for serial data line diagnosis. Bulletin 92T141A will lead you through it. We've been talking about one kind of serial data line. Actually, there are several types. We'll look at the three main ones. The one that's been used through 1995 for Oldsmobile PCM data lines is the Ewart bus. UART stands for Universal Asynchronous Receive Transmit, meaning all modules can both receive and transmit. 
The Entertainment and Comfort, or E&C bus, is used in most Oldsmobiles for air conditioning, heater, and audio modules and controls. Class 2 is a new kind of bus that will replace or complement the Ewart line in all 1996 Oldsmobiles. These three types of buses have important differences you'll need to understand. First, the Ewart line, which began as a PCM to DLC diagnostic line, but grew to include other modules as the bus route was extended. You'll find the Ewart schematic and sometimes some diagnostics in section 8A50 of most recent service manuals. In fact, any other buses should also appear in the 8A50s after this one. This is the basic 88 and 98's Ewart schematic simplified for video. It includes the airbag module, the derm, the PCM, the rack module, the HVAC programmer, the IP cluster, the anti-lock brake system module, and the data link connector. What's on the line can differ a lot from vehicle to vehicle. But in every Ewart line, one module is the designated master of the bus and acts rather like the operator on a telephone line. In this system and most systems, the master is the PCM. In a few vehicles like the 1995 Sunfire and Cavalier, the IPC is the master. While in other systems, the IPC isn't even on the Ewart line. In the Toronado, the body control module is the master of the Ewart bus. In all Ewart systems, the master of the bus schedules all communications. It requests all messages from other modules, receives and digests them, and distributes the information learned to whichever other modules need it, using special bits in the message to identify the appropriate recipients. Voltage for the circuit, 5 volts is always available from all modules, so with no communication, the system would rest at 5 volts. When a module is asked to supply information, it sets up its square wave response by leaving that 5 volts applied to signal each high bit and grounding the voltage for each low bit. It sends the pulsing message out at both terminals and receives messages the same way. Messages addressed to it are read and responded to. Messages not addressed to it are simply passed through. Some modules on the Ewart line are in frequent communication with the master. Others may not be. For example, in many systems, the rack module is included just so the bus can be used for programming keyless entry modules with their transmitters. By the way, 800 is the number generally used for a vehicle's Ewart circuit. The Aurora actually has two Ewart lines. Here's its schematic from section 8A50. The primary circuit is the 800 line, and the PCM is its master. The manual calls this bus Ewart A, or serial data line 1. The cluster is on this bus, and it's also on the second Ewart bus, which runs from the DLC to the IP cluster to the driver information center. In fact, the cluster is the master of this second bus, which is numbered 816. The manual calls it Ewart B, or serial data line 2. Ewart B is there because Ewart A was getting overcrowded with messages. We've been talking about the Ewart line during normal mode communication. When you connect a Tech 1 to the bus and enter bidirectional diagnostics, the Tech 1 becomes the master and can command the functions of the various modules for testing purposes. So far, the Ewart lines we've talked about are ring formations. But because both power and ground are provided by the modules, a serial data circuit really needs only a single line. So ring circuits have a backup flow path, and an open one place in the line wouldn't have any effect every module could still communicate with every other. Probably the open would never even be known. But non-ring buses, like this Ewart for the Cutlass Supreme, have only one flow path. An open in this kind of line would end communication between any modules beyond the brake and the other components, including the DLC. 
components still connected would communicate as before. Understanding that can be a help in diagnosis. Now, much more briefly, the other two types of serial data lines. Some Oldsmobiles also have the second type of bus, an entertainment and comfort bus. The E and C bus allows driver control and technician testing of the heating and air conditioning and audio systems. In service manuals, E and C schematics follow the Ewart ones in the 8A50s. This E and C is for an 88 and 98. It includes the HVAC programmer, the HVAC control head, and the audio system. Other modules that might be included on an ENC bus are steering wheel components, a CD changer, and a cellular phone. The circuit number for the ENC bus is 835. On the ENC line, the high signal is ignition, or battery voltage, approximately 12 volts. This voltage is always available from every module. So approximately 12 volts is where this circuit rests between messages. For an E and C circuit, there is no master of the bus, but the radio has some key roles. First, it reports clock timing, which is the only message regularly sent over the line. Second, in some of the newer vehicles, the radio serves as a translator for driver commands. Here's how. In the 1995 98 and Aurora and some 88s, controls for climate and audio are on the instrument panel and on the steering wheel as well. In these cars, every driver command from the steering wheel, whether it's for audio or heater or air conditioning, is sent as a specific voltage on a separate line to the radio. Here it's converted to a square wave message. If it's a climate control command, the radio then sends it on by bus to the HVAC programmer, which makes the desired change. A climate command from the instrument panel simply goes from the HVAC control head to the programmer. In some other GM systems, steering wheel commands are all sent as serial data on the E and C bus after being translated from voltage values to serial data by an interface module. As we've said, there's no master on an ENC line. Messages are originated by the driver and by the radio, those clock timing messages. Each module simply responds to every message that pertains to it. And in case two messages are transmitted at once, each message has an assigned priority. The higher priority message is received, and the lower priority message must be sent again. Because driver commands are much simpler messages than Ewart messages, and because they're sent only occasionally, the E and C bus transmits messages at only one-eighth the speed of the busy Ewart system. One more point before we move to the third kind of bus. You may have noticed that for the 88, the 98, and the Aurora, the HVAC programmer is on the Ewart bus and the E and C bus. When a module is on both buses, it may be used to transfer information from one to the other. For example, on 88s and 98s that have a driver information center, the DIC uses clock timing from the radio for DIC time and for the DIC date. How did the radio's clock timing get there? It changed buses, switching from the E and C at the HVAC programmer then riding on the UART to the IPC, which delivers it to the DIC. On the other hand, the Aurora's DIC has its own clock. Get used to that idea of message transfer from bus to bus. Mm -hmm. We'll see a lot more of it in the future. Now for the third type of serial data line, the Class II bus. It's coming in all 1996 Oldsmobiles in response to federal action concerning PCM to DLC communication. The Class II meets a recent federal requirement that emissions-related diagnostic communications be standardized throughout the industry. At first, in some vehicles, the PCM and the data link connector may be the only components on the new line. Eventually, other components will be added, and the Class II bus is likely to replace the UART line. 
The most important thing about diagnosing the Class II bus will be understanding what to expect when you check its voltage. Unlike the other two buses, which rest at their high voltages, the Class II rests at zero volts. Like an E&C bus, the Class II has no master. When several messages are involved, each one includes bits that identify the sending and receiving modules and the priority of the message itself. One difference with the Class II bus is that high voltage is 7 volts, not 5. Another difference is that bits don't all extend for the same length of time, but for either of two possible lengths. So different bytes could be of different duration. The difference to you is that the Tech 1 can't read Class 2, except with a special adapter, which you'll get next year. Now, the Tech 2, when we get it, will talk Class 2, but that's another story. How fast is the Class 2 bus? It transmits more than 10,000 bits per second for normal communication and more than 41,000 for programming proms. Talk about flash programming. Okay, those are the three main data line systems you'll be dealing with in the next few years. Now, what about diagnosing these systems? I want to stress four points. First, when you get no Tech 1 communication or vehicle systems that are behaving strangely, remember that a bus may have broken down. Here's another example of strange behavior that suggests a bus problem. I heard recently of a Cadillac whose cooling fans ran all the time. The fans were operated by the body control module. So, was the BCM faulty? No, the BCM ran the fans according to coolant temperature, which was reported by the PCM. In this case, both component systems were working fine. But the bus had broken down, so the modules couldn't communicate. When it couldn't learn coolant temperature, the BCM defaulted to running the fans constantly to protect the engine. So when you see weird symptoms, ask yourself, could this be default behavior, meaning serial data isn't being delivered? That's one good way to keep the bus in mind. Second, get familiar with the bus section in the 8A50s. The schematics show which modules are on each serial data line. And, of course, they'll help you when you need to do circuit diagnosis. And beginning in 1995, in Section 8A50, service manuals have a diagnostic procedure for the UART system for use whenever the Tech 1 can't communicate with the module. This will lead you through a check of the bus. Of course, 8A50 doesn't do everything for you. The schematics don't show what information is sent between modules and who uses it for what. To learn that, you'd need to check each system's own diagnostics in the manual. Third, always start actual diagnosis by using the Tech 1 and following the regular diagnostic procedure in the service manual. After all, the Tech 1 operates by riding the buses, so it's always the tool to start with. For an 88, 98, or Aurora, you need to use the correct 12 to 16 pin adapter, the one with the switch. Its positions are marked SDL2 and ENC. Defaults in the software mean you don't have to worry about switch position. Anytime you need to change, the Tech 1 will prompt you. If the Tech 1 can't establish any communication over a bus, first make sure that the Tech 1's okay and that you're using the right adapter if needed. If all that's okay, there's a faint possibility that there's an open between the DLC and the rest of the line. But it's much more likely that the bus is shorted to ground somewhere. So check the circuit for a ground fault using the schematic in 8A50. But if the Tech 1 can communicate, follow strategy-based diagnostics to begin zeroing in on the problem. If you find a diagnostic trouble code, that'll probably point to the problem. On some UART lines, you might get a code like this one. Loss of serial data codes help diagnose faults in the bus itself. 
Or you might find a code for a fault in some totally different system, which is failing to get a needed message onto the bus. But even without a code, the vehicle's symptoms will probably point to the faulty system. And as strategy-based diagnostics tell you, you should turn next to that system's chart. After all, the cause could be something like a fault in that module's own power or ground. But if there are no trouble codes and individual system charts don't solve the problem, next try to communicate with each module on the bus. If one or more won't respond, check for help in the 8A50s. You may find a diagnostic chart like this one. If not, you can use the schematic for planning your own electrical diagnosis. If all modules do respond, use the Tech 1 to check whether information you're wondering about can make it onto the bus and off the bus. Here's an example. Remember that Cadillac with the fan problem? With that type of vehicle, you could scan the PCM data list to make sure the PCM was reading coolant temperature okay and getting it onto the data line. And with bi-directional output tests, you could operate the fans to prove that the BCM could read serial data and respond by turning the fans on. This is smart bus diagnosis, using the Tech 1 for device control as well as for eavesdropping on serial data conversation. The E and C bus has no trouble codes to transmit, but you can diagnose it with the Tech 1 in other ways. When you select E and C, the Tech 1 will tell you to move the adapter switch to the E and C position. Under Select Mode, you can choose various Tech 1 functions, perhaps including some device control or bi-directional tests. On this 88, selecting Speaker Test lets you check each audio speaker separately. For all buses, expect these Tech 1 functions to increase in the future. The more our vehicles use these buses, the more you'll need to diagnose problems this way. But when the Tech 1 indicates there's a breakdown in bus communication, you'll need to check voltage in the circuit. And it's very important to know what the voltage readings for the bus should be under various conditions. To measure bus voltage, connect the voltmeter to the bus you're checking at the DLC and to ground. Refer to the schematic if you're not sure which terminal is the right one. If you're using an auto-ranging meter, manually set it to the 40-volt scale. If you let it auto-range on a fluctuating serial data line, it'll drive you nuts. With the ignition on, read voltage. With a Ewart system, this is what you should see. Voltage should fluctuate somewhere between 0 and 5 volts. In an older vehicle that has only the PCM on its UART line and therefore no steady flow of communication, you could catch the system at rest at approximately 5 volts. But on recent cars, what you'll see is fluctuation. In real time, those normal highs and lows pass too quickly to be displayed. So you'll probably see a fluctuation of only 1 or 2 volts. A steady reading of zero volts is most likely to indicate a ground somewhere in the system. And a steady voltage somewhere above zero and below five volts, such as 2.8 or 3.6, would indicate a failure in the communication chip of one module. Normal voltage in the Class 2 bus will act the same way, with the exception I mentioned before the Class 2 bus rests at zero voltage, not the system high of seven volts. And you might see this resting voltage in those systems which will have only the PCM on the bus. So, on a Class 2 bus, don't think zero voltage means a ground in the line and pull the PCM. Zero may well mean the bus is fine. On the E and C bus, voltage will generally rest at close to the system high of 12 volts, unless you operate one of the driver controls. And in some systems, this high voltage may be seen even with the key off. When you do operate a control, such as the radio volume control, you should see fluctuation. 
and the range of fluctuation will be higher than with the other buses because of that 12 volt high. A steady zero volts, as with the other buses, would indicate a probable ground, though, as always, it could indicate an open between the DLC and the rest of the system. Of course, the main trick with diagnosing any vehicle system is understanding how it works. With serial data lines, that can be tricky. But if you try to solve a bus problem without understanding it, you're playing by chance with much worse odds than I've got here. So if you're not already an expert on buses, now is the perfect time to get on board. See you next time.